Okay, well, hello everybody. A very warm welcome to you. Um, we're, let's uh, get the uh, the welcome slide up um, with all the, the people that you're hopefully going to see on the webinar today. Hello everybody and welcome to this fourth Constructive Conversations event from the Transforming Construction Network Plus. I'm Jackie Glass from University College London, and I'm going to be joined by these wonderful people today in this event. Thank you so much for registering to join us today. Um, we are recording the event uh, so that folks can watch um, and enjoy the conversation themselves at a later time, as of course we always do. So let me first of all, um, you know, I'm going to I'm just take a moment to uh, just uh, do some housekeeping, etc., with you and start warming us up to the conversation. I'm going to uh, just uh, overview that we have uh, um, Diana. Uh, Diana's going to be co-chairing me today. Uh, hello, Diana. Nice to see you. Hello, Jackie. Um, I'll let Diana do a little bit more of an introduction a little uh, in a few moments time. Um, Karen is with us today, uh, Andy and Jennifer. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things we want to do in the Transforming Construction Network Plus is bring the conversations together. And there'll be plenty of opportunity for all of you to get involved as we go through our hour. So um, let's move on the slides then, shall we? Um, and just do, do a little bit of housekeeping with you. Um, it is being recorded. So um, be mindful perhaps of what we're, well, I should say to ourselves, let's be mindful of how we're uh, addressing everybody today and let's use the chat and Q&A responsibly. Um, and in that, um, if you've got a direct question for us, please use the Q&A function. But if you want to have a bit of a conversation and say, hello, I'm here, use the chat, please. We're really open to that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, if you feel like using social media whilst we're having this conversation, please go right ahead. Um, we've got a hashtag, of course, the one we've been using throughout the Network Plus, um, and you can follow, of course, our own Twitter account. So please do tweet uh, your reactions to our conversation. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, for those of you who have joined us before on our events, you'll know that the Network Plus has been a project funded through the Industrial Strategy through UKRI, and it's part of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, the Transforming Construction Challenge. And transform is kind of what we've been trying to do in the last sort of two and a half years. Um, the Network Plus is a collaboration between UCL, Imperial College London, and WMG, the Warwick Manufacturing Group. All of our resources are still on our website, um, and the link is there for you to access them as you wish. Uh, next slide, thank you. For those of you who are not familiar with the remit of the Network Plus, you know, these are the things that we've been trying to do. And one way or another, we hope to continue to do. Building the community, building the conversation, expanding our knowledge base on the transformation of the construction industry. And we're trying now to really go into a legacy phase, aren't we, Diana, with this whole transforming construction mm -hmm. challenge. What have we learned already? Let's get it into practice and let's keep that learning going. So really important phase that we're at now. And if you if we just jump on to the next slide, you know, the reason we're having this event today is another one of our digest publications. Many of you have seen these already. Um, we published this not a lot, not long ago, actually. And it was an important moment to say, look, if we are going to transform the industry, we absolutely need to work together here. And we believe that industry and academia can work together better. And that's why we're here today. So uh, towards the end of the webinar, we're going to share with you the links um, that you can download all of our digests if you've not done so already. But I just want to give you a little taster. Let's jump on to the next slide um, just to give you a sense. You know, these are the sorts of things we're going to start to get into today. A little bit about the mechanisms of collaboration, about the ways we're working together, the ethos perhaps in the way that we're working together. What can we change? What do we need to change for our industry, for our sector? and our community. Um, uh, I think we've got some takeaways on the next slide, haven't we there, Zoe? Um, and, you know, from the digest, here, here's the sensitivities, if you like. You know, people come to collaborations and uh, R&D collaborations, they come with their own time spans, their own needs, and their own perspectives. And that's something we need to work with. It may mean that the traditional ways of working together don't always fit so we need to be a bit more versatile, perhaps. Um, and with that in mind, um, you know, one of the things, uh, let's just jump on to the next slide. I, I just want to just 
bring a take a moment, if you like, in introducing before we get to our speakers, um, in introducing the topic in a slightly scholarly manner, as you might expect, folks. Um, you know, one of the things that I read very recently really added to this diagram, which I created a few years ago um, uh, when I was um, I was looking after enterprise um, in uh, Loughborough uh, University, and I was trying to explain to people. How do academics and industry work together? Well, if you see that list on screen right now, what you'll see is there are lots of different ways of working together. But you know what? It's not one size fits all. And actually, you know, there are quite sort of modest ways of connecting, you know, through dis you know, industry can come and support lectures or dissertation projects, etc. But that's that's a fairly limited scope, if you like, in terms of what you can achieve. It's only really when you start getting to the, the base of that pyramid that you can see on screen, those sort of longer term, more meaningful, more expansive uh, working relationships that you start to see some bigger changes unfold. Holding. In construction, the folks in the academic community, from our perspective, divide into sort of almost two camps. Those who are more, a bit more on the sort of the engineering side who might be producing technical or product innovations, and those of us perhaps on the more management side who are actually interested in the ways of doing business. And um, as you'll see on the ch on the uh, chat just now, um, I'd like to flag um, a little publication that came out recently. It's a, a small article by Laura Spence and Paul DeGay, and they have written a small piece in uh, Business and Society Journal. This is one for you academics out there. I'm just going to read you just two very short moments from that, uh, very short quotes from that piece. Here we are. Taking involvement seriously not only requires time to invest in building long-term partnerships, it also takes a good deal of courage uh, to take a stance on a particular course of action and take responsibility if you're making claims, and this is for academics, um, when somebody is gonna potentially follow our advice, so, so scholars giving advice to industry, you've gotta be prepared that there could be real world consequences for that. But Laura and Paul remind us, wouldn't it be odd actually, if we didn't want to be involved in the world that we study. So with impact and involvement, engagement, let's talk about all those things in a bit more detail in our session today. Um, I want to move straight into um, Diana. Um, I wonder if you'd just like to introduce yourself as our co-chair today. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, yes, I'm, I'm co-chair, I guess, with the business hat on. I've been the chief executive, now chief operations officer, for the Construction Products Association for the past nine years. Um, I've worked in a number of sectors and I think one of the things I can bring to construction is to hold the mirror up on those other sectors. So I've worked in chemicals, energy, fast moving consumer goods, among others. Um, I guess if I could uh, say in a few words what my passion for construction is about, it's about how to enable change and has been through all my time in the sector. So because of that, uh, not only am I involved with Jackie on the M Plus uh, advisory group, I chair the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund advisory group, which is the overarching group bringing together academia and uh, industry senior business leaders to advise Innovate UK and the programme on the way forward. Um, I also am on the Construction Innovation Hub Industrial Advisory Board, and we met this morning to yet again talk about really how we create a legacy, how that's sustainable, um, and how we move forward. So I think this is absolutely the right time for this seminar. And lastly, uh, something that's really dear to my heart is I'm on the board of the Considerate Constructor Scheme and the Building a Safer Future Charter, which has been launched relatively recently. And the charter is about really taking our industry from where we were in terms of perhaps a monitoring approach to construction, to deep audit in the way the chemical industry has its responsible care program and a number of other sectors, nuclear, oil and gas, have programs where the sector trade associations help companies to be really, really good. And there's a shared learning. And I think that brings us full circle back to, to the collaboration between industry and academia, because I would say in those sectors, I observe a much more dynamic and long term relationship than perhaps I've seen in construction. So I think that's a challenge for us going forward. So thank you, Jackie. I hope that's helpful positioning and I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much, Diana there. 
Um, I, I'm sure you will have some interventions to make a little later on, so I appreciate that. Um, so uh, why don't we move into uh, to our first speaker? Um, and I think we've got a cover slide for you here, Karen. Um, a warm welcome to you. Delighted that you could join and share some of your experiences with us. I have to say, in, in meeting you, Karen, I, I've been absolutely bowled over by the sort of projects that you've been working on and the way that you're trying to engage everybody through the project life cycle as well into um, R&D and learning. But let's let's get into um, a little bit of the conversation. And Karen, um, over to you, please. Lovely. Thanks, Jackie. So I'm coming at it from a major projects perspective. I've worked in major projects for about 25 years, starting out as a young engineer before moving into PMOs and program assurance. Well, my main focus in the last 12 years or so has been on supporting major projects, including London 2012, Crossrail, HS2, and the Houses of Parliament Restoration and Renewal Programme, aimed at capturing and sharing their learning, innovation, and good practice through learning legacy and continuous learning programmes with the goal of raising the bar in industry. And academic engagement and collaboration has been a common element across all of these. So during this time, I've seen a shift in academic engagement on major projects from capturing and sharing knowledge from a project for the benefit of future projects and published in academic journals to a more collaborative approach whereby the research is benefiting the actual project while also ensuring high quality academic outputs. So at London, engagement was through the Learning Legacy Programme. Learning Legacy was set up in response to the many requests we had from industry and academia to capture the learning and good practice from the programme. So we supported a number of academic research projects and to capture the learnings and successes on subjects such as health and safety, program management and environment. And these were published in high quality academic journals with plain English summaries for industry professionals on the Learning Legacy website, which is now the major project on the Major Projects Association Knowledge Hub. So these papers are still useful today. And in fact, I've seen these used recently in benchmarking on the Houses of Parliament Restoration and Renewal Programme. However, all the knowledge captured on London 2012 was at the end of the project, and in particular, it was intended to capture the learning for future projects and programmes. So Crossrail was a step change in that respect, as well as academics continuing to engage on capturing academics were also embedded into the programme, in particular to develop its approach to innovation on the project. So the industry university collaboration enabled Crossrail to be the first major project to implement a structured mythology to innovation, resulting in millions of pounds of benefit to the programme and setting the standard for future innovation programmes. The resulting Innovate 18 platform was subsequently handed over to industry as the I3P platform, a subscription based innovation platform, for which one of our next speakers, Andy Mitchell, was instrumental in establishing. HS2 has gone even further, fully embracing the academic uh, industry collaborative approach through relationships with UCRIN, the UK Rail Research and Innovation Network, UCRIC, the UK Collaboratorium for Research um, on Infrastructure and Cities, and CSIC, the Cambridge Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction, which we'll hear more uh, from Jennifer, Professor Jennifer Schooling in a bit. These relationships providing HS2 with access to world leading research capabilities at the cutting edge of rail innovation, aiming to help accelerate new technologies and products from research to market. So as the learning legacy lead to for HS2, which is being launched later this year, I'm working through the research and innovation team to ensure that as well as its application in the project and publication in academic journals, all research and innovations from the programme are captured in plain English summaries on the learning legacy for easy dissemination to other industry professionals. Interestingly, I'm seeing a huge step change in people's appetite to share their knowledge, in particular by the supply chain. At London 2012 and Crosswell, there's a huge appetite by the client body and some involvement in the supply chain, but nowhere near the level of engagement that I'm seeing at HS2 in the supply chain. I'm also working with the Houses of Parliament Restoration and Renewal Programme, which is at the REBA 2 concept design stage. So they know they need to do think in innovatively to achieve the programme objectives. For example, it's been said that if traditional approaches to cleaning the stone are used, then it would take 30 years to complete. So research and innovation is very much on their agenda. 
we've been considering what role research plays in that, direct academic collaboration, engineering doctorates, fellowship schemes, which are used widely in Parliament, or collaboration with organisations such as CSIC and the Construction Innovation Hub. So the programme's already had some successes working with academics such as Professor Henrik Schoenfeld from University of Kent, who's been embedded in the programme for a number of years, researching the historical ventilation system in the Palace of Westminster, and he's published many academic papers. However, he's also used his research to develop a BIM model that is being used to inform the future ventilation design for the palace. There's also seed funding um, that's been recently provided to Harriet Watt University, led by Professor Guy Walker, in collaboration with the Health, Safety and Wellbeing team. And this research is focused on delivering step change in safety, productivity and constructability through a socio-technical systems approach with the potential to save millions in reduced health and safety incidents and absenteeism alone. So there's some real benefits coming out of the industry um, um, in business collaboration. So there's been a real step change, as I say, in a knowledge sharing culture in major projects, both at client level and at the top tiers of the supply chain. There are, however, some challenges in the industry acad academic collaboration. So I think we need to make sure that research and innovations from the big projects are accessible to the smaller projects. So one of the barriers that Construction 2025 identifies is the loss of innovation at the end of the project. And in fact, this is some of the feedback that I received uh, in my early discussions at, at HS2. You, you deliver the innovation, you move on to the next big thing. So learning legacy is a structured way of enabling that knowledge transfer. And we need all major projects to commit to publishing research and innovations openly for use by others. And the same goes for the I3P innovation platform. All the innovation is shared behind a subscription wall. And whilst I understand the need to fund these platforms, Maybe the answer is to agree to publish all innovations after a certain time period so that they can be shared um, as learning legacies accessible to all. And the other thing is ensuring that we've got sufficient data on return on investment and budget planning. So you really struggled at this when we were planning research at uh, Restoration and Renewal Programme. Knowing what budget should be allocated and developing the business case for research investment and knowing that would help remove the funding barriers that we find in how we're going to fund uh, research on the programme. So it would be really helpful to have some data on the ROI of uh, industry academic collaborations from other major projects and other sectors, and perhaps guidance on the percentage budget that should be allocated by mega, major, large, medium uh, projects. So I believe that co-creation and sharing of new and innovative knowledge is key to bring in productivity of the construction sector in line with other industry sectors and industry academic collaboration is a key role to play in that. It's brilliant that we're seeing this shift and this is the kind of, that this kind of forum is happening and we're definitely moving in the right direction. Thank you, Jackie. Well, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, and, and, and up beat an encouraging message there, but also a challenge I notice major projects committing a percentage of budget towards this. Um, I, I like the sound of that very much indeed. And thank you for citing a specific couple of examples of colleagues who have been in academic colleagues who have been embedded in projects. That's really encouraging to hear. Um, but you, you've, um, well, you've set an agenda there. Um, and it brings us very neatly on Karen, thank you to uh, our second speaker. Um, and that's uh, Andy Mitchell. Um, uh, from Tideway. Now, Andy, um, I, I, are you with us? Um, I think you are uh, with us today. Um, uh, a warm welcome to you for taking the time to join us, leading a major project. Um, I wonder if we might hear from you for a few minutes, Andy. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. Can you hear me and see me? Uh, all loud and clear. Thank you very much. Jolly good. No, I had a few. Uh, I'm, I'm coming in on my iPad because the laptop uh, wouldn't let me do it. But um, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I, I guess I'm wearing two two hats today. One is the, uh, the being the CEO of Tideway, and um, you know I, I totally endorse everything that uh, Karen that Karen has just said. And we're very proud on Tideway that um, building on the mm. Crossrail um, Innovate 18. Uh, uh, you know we we said we would be the next host or mothership project, if you like, but uh, that was all part of the decision to, well, we really have to open this up to 
become the industry thing and, and I3P. And um, I spent uh, two or three years chairing the, the launch of all that. And I'm really, really pleased to see that that's become an established um, platform. And of course, we, you know, we're, we're active members of that. And um, on Tideway, we're two thirds complete and we're looking to the end. And um, so we, we have a limited amount of time left to, to make use of um, true, truly new things. But I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're doing um, around this issue of not just writing the reports at the end of the day, but trying to make active use of them, um, which is going very well within Tideway. Um, I'm also wearing the hat of the uh, co-chair of the Construction Leadership Council, which has transformed itself over the past 18 months. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. But, you know, everything we deal with uh, on CLC um, just shouts that almost everything we do has to change. Uh, you know, I think we all understand the climate change, but let's just talk about sustainability more, more, more generally um, and building safety. Um, and, and we're talking about the whole built environment and, and not just when we we tend to think about infrastructure as the economic infrastructure, the roads and the rail and the big projects and uh, you know, the sort of stuff I've done all my life. But really, it is it is the built environment. And when we talk of, about climate change in 2050 and, and I've heard different statistics, but way more than 80 percent of all the built environment that's going to exist in 2050 exists today so it's all very well getting fascinated about how we build new stuff but the the truth is and that's important and we must get that right but the truth is um we've got all of our existing buildings all of our existing built environment most of which needs some kind of change uh, and a different way of doing things that, that we haven't done before so you know for me that never has innovation and doing things differently been more important than than it is today and you know and that, yes that touches everything power generation the storage of power whether that's hydrogen or some other ele you know, electrical form building design and 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 damn near everything and and of course what what covid has done for us over the past 18 months is proved that if you need to change quickly you can change quickly and it, it's a really important point that uh, you know we're very clear on with the clc which, which is um, we've just proved how much we can do in a year. Now, let's not say, you know, pandemic behind us, let's go back to normal. That's not an option. Ch change has to now be an, an accelerating constant, if, if you like. Um, you know, when we talk about innovation, I, I, th I, I found it very useful to talk about two separate subjects. One is the process of innovation. Um, which and, and I think the whole I3P thing and the the uh, involvement of academia in the establishment of Innovate 18, you know, the whole David Gann, Andrew Davis, Sam McCauley, all of whom have gone to other places, but uh, we're all in the thick of that. And that would not have happened had there not been a concerted effort between uh, a, a committed client, a client that was big enough uh, to, to, to have the budget, and, and Karen's point of view, or sorry, your point of, um, you've got to recognize that you've got to invest in innovation and you've got to be confident that you're going to get something out of it. And, and, and you know, Crossrail had the foresight to, to, to do that. Um, but we were struggling to understand, well, how do you do this? What is innovation? And we had all sorts of talks about, well, is, is innovation just the, the fancy R&D stuff or actually is it just doing something that you haven't done in that context before? And, and we decided that actually the broadest possible definition was more helpful. So anything that looked different or looked new or perhaps was a different way of looking at life, um, we would call an innovation. And I think that was a massively important part. Um, and then, of course, you've got the straight R&D and all the technical challenges that we've got but, and the obvious links uh, necessary between um between industry and academia um one of the things that we're finding now at the back end of the project is uh, we we absolutely didn't want to um just write up the reports and put them somewhere with no real conviction that anyone would ever get anything uh, out of them no matter how plainly we wrote them or whatever and 
we've so fine we're on the i3p platform and we've done all, all, all sorts of um cool stuff with that if, if i'm honest but what we're running now internally is a is a lessons learned forum and and we that's a monthly gathering about 50 or 60 people who uh are just offering things up sharing things that they're doing that they think might be interesting think might be useful for others and they think is something that perhaps uh, hasn't been done before and you know, on our system at the moment, we've got something like 1,700 uh, files of, of things like that, um, which is great. And, and obviously we're at a point now where, you know, we've got 20 odd shafts and we're doing the same damn thing to 20 shafts. And you'd be surprising how many different ways there are of lining a, a shaft, um, whether all that variation is necessary or not, uh, perhaps another question, but nonetheless, We've got lots of teams out there that are doing things that they are really, really keen to make sure that other people know what they're doing and to understand what other people are doing. And it's a really lively, really thirsty um, uh, in, environment. And um, and one of the things that that comes clear out of that is that what people find really useful is, yes, you, you can go somewhere where there's a whole bunch of stuff and you can trawl through it, but actually... Part of what we're doing, we're not being very prescriptive over the format. So put down what you need to put down and anyone that wants to understand it will understand it and don't worry about a consistent format, which I think is making it easier. But the thing that people really find helpful is um, knowing, who to, knowing who wrote it and knowing who to talk to. So it's a kind of, yes, it's a, it's a sharing, it's a collaborative approach that we've got and it's a repository, but it's, it's also a dating agency for for putting people together uh, to, to further the conversations that, that, um, that, that come out of the things that people are doing. And, and I think that's a really important part. So when we look at uh, innovation going forward, and if I had sort of top tips for, for um, industry, I would say you've got to recognize that innovation is not uh, an option. It's not a luxury. It's, it's a fundamental requirement of what you're doing. You've got to recognize that you've got a budget for that. Um, and you know, people talk about percentages. Uh, if you look at the, you know, the, the higher tech industries, they work on way, way higher uh, margins. Our R&D percentage of turnover of you know, 5, 10, 15% wouldn't be uncommon. And those kind of percentages would, would scare the, you know, the, the living daylights out of people in construction, but it, the, and I'm not suggesting it should be 10%, but I don't think it's a half percent either. We, you know, it, we do need to recognize we're spending big money. We have to find better ways of doing that. And you're not going to do that without investing. So take that seriously. It's not a luxury or a nice to have. It's something fundamental that you should do from the very beginning and understand the journey that you're going to, you're going to go on. To, to academia, I think I've got a, re a request, um, which Yes, of course, reach out and, and uh, establish the, the proper R&D links with all the different parts of the industry. But also, I think, understand the role that you can play in, in developing the innovation process and the sharing and collaboration. Um, I know some of the big projects we're talking about are, are, are long-term projects, but they all have a, a, a limited life. So the projects come and go and whatever we do, we write up and we'll stick on a website, but we won't be here in five years time and, and, and it can all be lost. But the universities are here in five and 10 and 15 years time. So what role perhaps could, you know, could academia together play in creating that accessible repository? And yes, I get the I3P point and, 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 I, and I totally agree that there should be some time um, release where more sharing could and should be done but um more more generally um given the the transient nature of the the big projects where, where a lot of uh, encouraging now a lot of effort is going into innovation what could uh what could academia do to to provide a place where we can all plant stuff that we know is going to be there in 10 years time or or, or longer than the life of the project. And that would be a, uh, a request. And how do you combine that with a dating agency such that you can actually then get hold of the people that wrote the stuff in the first place? And, and is that some kind of, you know, I, I don't know, wiki type 
I, I don't I do not know, but I know that that doesn't exist and and it would be really helpful if um, if academia could uh, have a hand in that. Andy, thank you very much indeed for sharing your reflections today. Um, and I think, you know, you're making some very strong points there and directed very keenly towards industrial colleagues and acad academia. Um, uh, we're going to move, I think that's a great point to set out. And in a second, I'm going to ask Jennifer Schooling um, from Cambridge to perhaps react to that and take mm -hmm. us through. Um, following Jennifer's uh, words, um, we're going to open up um, and we're going to start to look at some questions that are coming through on the on the Q&A and in the chat, actually. We're going to do our best to pick out some of those for our speakers to react to. Um, but first of all, uh, Andy, thanks very much indeed. Uh, excellent points. Um, Jennifer, um, Come on in, a warm welcome to you. Um, I don't want you to feel pressured, but Andy set out a bit of an agenda for academics there, hasn't he? He certainly has. And I think, you know, everything he said and actually everything all the previous speakers have said is, is absolutely pertinent to what we're doing. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on me, I'm the director, as you can see on the screen, of the Cambridge Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction, or CSIC for short. Um, and we are reasonably unique in that we're funded as an innovation and knowledge centre, which basically means we get our funding from both EPSRC and Innovate UK. Um, and it was set up that way to facilitate us working closely with industry and collaborating really closely with industry. So we've sort of been given permission, if you like, to go beyond the boundaries that are sort of that you often universities find themselves in of working at the the, the sort of the very low technology readiness levels and doing the, the sort of traditional academic research. And actually we're funded to do that obviously, but then to go out and collaborate really proactively with industry to try and get the outcomes of good research into practice much more quickly. And I think that's really fundamental to addressing some of the challenges that Andy was raising. You know, the fact that uh, it's actually much more than 80 percent, something like 90% or 95% of the infrastructure and built environment we're gonna have around us in 2050 is with us now. So we have to address how that is going to perform um, in, in a changing climate, for example. Um, we've got the, um, the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis facing us. So, um, you know, we really do have to work closely together. I'm going to come back to that at the end to address some of these big challenges. Um, and I think what we found in CSIC has been really helpful is that, you know, when we set off 10 years ago now, um, we did a lot of really proactive engagement with industry and the colleagues who set CSIC up did a, a lot of road mapping work and brought partners on board, not just to sort of turn up every now and again to a steering group meeting, although we did have plenty of those for our projects, um, but also to help shape the projects so that the outputs and the outcomes could be trialled um, on real construction sites or on real existing infrastructure. Um, and, and to build the relationships that would enable us then to, to take those solutions into real sites. Um, and we had some we've had some fantastic learnings from that. And um, both Karen and Andy brought up the, the Crossrail um, innovation activity. So we actually went into Crossrail and instrumented a number of the um, tunnel linings, for example. Um, and actually, we've got to talk, I think, tomorrow about, about um, the findings from some of that work and how that could potentially change how we uh, do spray concrete lining work in the future on tunnels. Um, and we're forever building new tunnels. You know, Tideway have been building, obviously, a massive tunnel, but HS2 are coming up with a lot more tunnels to build. There's the Lower Thames Crossing, that has tunnels. So there's an awful lot that um, we've already done and that colleagues across academia have already done that can start to be rolled out. Um, and as well as doing things where the work leads to learning, we've also, through these relationships that we've built up, managed to actually do work where we've been collecting data live and streaming it back to um, the construction process to their dashboards so that they're able to react and respond to it immediately, as well as us then using the data sort of in the future for further research. So one really nice example of that was some work that we did um, around the bank station upgrade work in London, where um, in order to upgrade bank station, which was a real kind of um, constriction point on the network, particularly for getting people between different um, tube lines, they needed to uh, create a new station hall and they also needed to drive um, some new tunnels through. And those two activities were happening next to and underneath the beautiful St Mary Ab Church, which is a 400 year old church that was um, designed and built by Sir Christopher Wren. It's got these amazing frescoes on the inside of it. 
And the last thing you want when you're doing a major construction project is to have a negative impact on a piece of fantastic cultural heritage like that. The trouble we had was that the traditional um, ways of monitoring these things actually don't suit themselves very well to the kind of you know aged masonry structure that that was. And the traditional approaches to um, managing the risk, for example, compensation grouting, um, also don't really suit it because the best thing to do to a 400 year old structure that's had bombs landing next to it 60, 80, 70, 80 years ago and so forth is as little as possible. So what we were able to do was come in and deploy in addition to the traditional sensing that the um, contractor was going to use, deploy some of the sensing that we developed so that we could get a dynamic view of exactly how the church was behaving in response to the construction. Um, and we use that as the risk mitigation actually to say, okay, all the while we're monitoring this, we'll set a number of triggers. And if they go over a certain level, then either the construction has to slow or we have to start doing one of these um, mitigation measures. Um, but in fact, we were able to show throughout the construction that the, the structure was fine, which saved, you know, a million pounds in avoided works, um, but also then gave us the data so that we can we could develop better models for how masonry structures respond to ground movement and so forth. So, you know, that, that, that was a real win-win situation for us and for our industry partners. So I think sort of coming back to what we need to do moving forward, my experience is that for industry and universities and academia to, to work well together and, and get the outcomes of our good research into practice, it's very much about working together from the early days and building relationships um, you know, technology is great, but actually we move forward based on relationships and trust and mutual investment. So working together to plan projects, listening to each other to understand each other's constraints and each other's challenges. You know, as Andy said, some projects have a very limited lifetime. However, you know, people like Network Rail have assets which are 150 years old and they're looking at having to look after them for the next 150 years. So some circumstances, you've got a very long life and you could run research projects over a very long time if that were relevant. Um, so really sort of understanding each other's challenges, each other's problems, you know, what makes for good research, what makes for something that industry can then adopt, because I think what we found in CSIC is that what goes well into a traditional academic paper, you know, that, that new learning is great, but it's very difficult for industry often to grab hold of that and run with it. It needs some further development. Um, so I think we sort of need, in order to address challenges like the climate crisis, this collaboration is essential and I would like to say that we need radical collaboration um, because we've got to move from a model where you know we do good research it takes about 10 years for industry to discover it it takes them another 10 years to work out how to deploy it and before we know where we are it's 2050 and the climate crisis is you know is with us so we need to be proactive about how we engage with each other um, as academics we need to not Think that the job is done when we've published a paper but actually we do need to go out there and talk at academic at, at industry conferences contact our industry colleagues and say look we've done this is it of interest how might we help you adopt this kind of approach um, industry on the other hand needs to embrace the idea of innovation and doing things differently and, and you know everyone bef before me today has alluded to this um, innovation equals failure in 90 at least percent of, of, of the things that you try but if we don't innovate to meet the climate crisis, we are going to fail. It, that's just the case. We cannot afford to be timid when it comes to the climate crisis. We've got to be radical. And, you know, Andy said, well, you know, some industries put 10 to 15 percent into R&D and innovation. I'm not saying it should be that much. On, in one way, I think 100 percent of our construction projects should be about innovation because we've got to face the climate crisis. Um, we've got to work out how we're going to reduce the carbon we're emitting now, because every tonne of carbon we put up there today will be with us for the next 100 to 200 years. So we need to reduce carbon right now. And as industry, we need to embrace the prospect of failure and manage the risk um, and not just worry about, well, what's the risk to my, you know, my contract if X goes wrong, but recognise that things might go wrong and work um, both as delivery organisations and as clients to manage that process. And be prepared to try new things but fail fast um, and if we do that and we can be flexible with each other and importantly if funders can be flexible because the other problem that academia often has is you can get funded to do something the first time it's very hard to get funded to do it the second third and fourth time which is what industry needs um, so if we can all be more flexible and recognize each other's constraints and find ways to work around them then i think we really can increase the pace of change in our industry to the level it needs to be at to address things like the climate crisis. 
and the resource constraints that we're facing. I mean, it's not just Brexit, which obviously is causing problems with imports and things, but it's also just there aren't enough resources to do all the things we want to in the wasteful ways as a society we always have done. So we've got to get better at all of this. Um, and, and if we do all of that, then I think there's a really bright future for the built environment and construction industries. And I think I'll stop there. Jennifer, thank you very much um, for the, uh, some very strong words um, that you've shared with us, just the radical collaboration. You know, you've, you've echoed this sort of sense of urgency. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to say there's some great, lo a lot of activity going on in the chat and the Q&A at the moment. People are sharing links, ideas, all sorts of things. I appreciate you might not be seeing them on all the channels that you're seeing, but I can assure you behind the scenes, there's a lot going on. So that's fantastic. Thanks, Jennifer, for provoking more reactions there. Um, now we're gonna move into a Q&A session uh, right now. Um, um, and um, I think uh, Diana um, is going to start us off. And I can't hear you, Diana, I'm afraid. Uh, have we lost you? Oh, I'm, I'm there back. you are. Ah. I'm back. And I was just saying, I was going to ask questions myself, but there's some fantastic questions coming through on the Q&A. So I'm going to hop straight to uh, straight to some of those. So. A question from Ian Heptonstall, um, and I'll summarise. He basically says, um, you know, how are we using structured learning on legacy programmes, not only to learn the good bits, but he gives the example with Crossrail a few years ago when they expressed surprise that the project had come in late and was slightly more expensive than they perhaps hoped. Um, did we learn the lessons from that? Um, and Because that's as valuable as some of the more proactive stuff. So I think that's a really good question for, I think, all three panellists. Um, so should I go first? <laughs> um, so actually, um, I, I am aware that um, Crosswell have done some really good work in terms of sharing their learning uh, around what went wrong. And they have been um, engaging in um, conversations with HS2, and that's just the ones that I'm aware of. So, but I do agree that uh, this structured approach to learning, um, just getting better at what we do, is not always about research and innovation. We just need to learn the lessons from the past. And I do think um, having structured lessons learned processes in major projects is important. And then being able to share them more widely um, into the learning legacy is key. But I love this idea of the whole dating agency uh, concept of lessons learned and that getting people having conversations and making the, co the connections is a really important part of that thing. Yeah, thank you, Karen. And, and I have to say, for me, it, it's, it's, it's about this being more than just individual projects. And it's a problem that construction have that perhaps other sectors have to a lesser extent is how this isn't a project moving on to the next one with all new people. So, you know, the dating agency, hopefully they update their details so they can move on. But when you get to the end of the project, you know, it doesn't just be stuck on a shelf. It actually becomes something that's live and is passed on to the next project and the next project. And I think that's, that's really important. So thank you. I'm, I'm gonna ask another question, um, which was from uh, Kumar An Aniket. Um, and he's making the point that um, quite often construction innovation is actually just responsiveness versus true innovation. And the example he gives, which I really like, was um, smart motorways, which are absolutely brilliant short term in creating more capacity for the M42 is the one that springs to mind because we've all been caught on it. Um, but actually what it did was put more cars on the road, create more congestion and more pollution um, because people felt more able to use it. So how do we move from just solving an individual problem to, to actually taking that bigger picture piece. And I think that comes exactly to where Jennifer is challenging us about climate change. Because at the moment, what we're doing is often making other problems worse. Do you want me to have a, a go at starting a response to that? But I'll happily hand over to someone else afterwards. Um, I think this is where the idea of seeing things as systems of systems is really important. You know, our built environment is not just an assemblage of individual buildings and water pipes and power lines and so forth. It actually all works together as a system. My house or my office building are useless without 
the power lines coming into them, the water pipes coming into them, the sewer pipes going away from them, without a road that comes to my front door that enables me to hopefully cycle or walk rather than drive to wherever I need to go. Um, likewise, you know, the rail network relies fundamentally on the power network or on a power network um, and on a whole load of flood defences and so on and so forth. Um, so we have this complex system of systems that we've built up over the last 200 and more years. Um, we didn't design it as a system of systems, it's just evolved that way, but we have to embrace this fact and, and stop trying to chop everything up purely into sort of neatly manageable chunks, but actually stand back sometimes and say, how are these things impacting each other? Um, and, and how are they impacting us? Because fundamentally our built environments, our communities, our places are all about, you know, people thriving <laughs> and you know people move to cities because they're great places to be if a city ceases to be a great place to be people move out of it um so and that's all about the consequences of the built environment and the infrastructure and whether it's supporting a lively economy and, and so forth um and it's hard to take this systems view and politicians in particular hate it because they like a silver bullet and a magic wand to you know give us the give me the quick answer i'd much rather invest in that than the long hard answer even if the quick answer is 10 times more expensive and 10 times less effective often because it's easier to sell to an electorate um but we've really got to both embrace this challenge and explain it to others so that the electorate and the politicians can understand why this matters and and how we're not going to solve things like climate change with a single silver bullet, but actually we've got to look at how they play into each other. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, absolutely brilliant answer. And I think that's, you know, one of the, the really exciting things, if I can say it, in, it, that came out of the sector's response to COVID led by the CLC. It was a much more holistic response than I think we've ever seen mm -hmm. from construction before. And, and whilst it comes out of a horrible situation, I think we should take some real encouragement from mm. the way the industry came together, supported each other, and it really was quite a, a seminal moment. But uh, on that one, I'm going to pass back to Jackie, who I'm sure has been looking at some of the other questions. Oh, it's very active there, Diana. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I'm going to have to slightly turn this round for a moment, if I may. Um, uh, you know, I think it's a great point that you've made about the the harmon the harmony of the approach that CLC was able to mobilise um, from the industry side. And I'd actually like to turn this around. There's some conversation in the chat around the funding landscape, and actually, you know, that's what mobilises the academics. Um, so, you know, Andy, you've seen um, a, a question to you really. You know, you've seen the ways of mobilising mobilizing the industry and actually you know you have we have the construction leadership council why haven't we got the construction research council why haven't we got that centrality and place for our research to be funded mm. supported mm. and promoted andy what what could we do about that do you think yeah i think i'm you can hear me i can excellent so you know i let's be honest we I think we surprised ourselves and a lot of other people over the past 18 months in the way this industry did come together. And, um, and what, be, what was very obvious very early is that, yes, the industry's got the small one person band doing domestic repairs. And at the other end, you've got the nuclear power stations and whatever. But actually, um, we all depend on the flow of two things. One is materials and one is cash. And we act, and it, it, it became apparent that the ecosystem, if you want to call it that, of construction uh, is actually quite simple and it applies to everybody. And the more that penny dropped, the, the problem of the SME is the same problem, exactly the same problem um, uh, as, as it is for, for uh, you know, any of the really large stuff. And, and the more that became apparent, the more it became apparent that we could do a lot more together and we had a lot more uh, common interest than we ever thought. Um, and uh, clearly what we have to do is build on what we've just proven and, and I think the ambitions that we're setting out uh, through, through CLC are, are, are quite exciting. They need to be exciting, as we've said, because of the, uh, the extent of the challenges that we face. The, 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 the joined up nature of, uh, if you like, um, R&D, if that's how, how it goes, I think there's a really important... Um, the issue here in that we do have uh, one of the things that we were looking at pre-COVID and now needing to get back to, particularly with a levelling up agenda, um, which says that 
we, we do need to make sure that we've got distributed capability. Now, we've obviously got a university network that's distributed around the, around the country, and maybe that's part of it. But then you've got the likes of um, Warwick and Sheffield and uh, other places which are sort of manufacturing research centres themselves. And, and, and I think what we've got to do is build a, um, a map, a, a geographic map of what's where. You know, we, we've got the active building centre down in Cardiff. Well, great, but it, is that the only active building centre we um, need? No, it isn't. So why why are we not putting a pitch together on behalf of the industry that says if we're really serious to make change, we need one of those in every region. We need one of these in every region. And, and, and that does mean people need to be prepared to share. And, and, the, and I know they are down at the APPC in, in um, in Swansea prepared to say well this is what we do we're quite happy to put that up and and anyone wants to take this and do better than we are well that's great and tell us how you did it and so I think we we have to develop a plan that is a, a country-wide region-wide um, proposal of how we're going to to evolve uh, and develop and that really then has to be a fully wired fully communicated no silos no barriers um, uh, uh, approach and I don't see why that can't happen but it's uh, it's for us as an industry to put that case to government inevitably mm-hmm. um, and, I, and I think the more we, we, we've I think we're taken more uh, seriously and we're seen as more um, singularly voiced than we, we as an industry we probably ever have been uh, and I think now the time is ripe and and of course we you know the spending review later on this year is another opportunity to to do that and it is one of the things that we are talking about. Andy thank you very much indeed and it, it strikes me you know that we have the construction playbook um, which is mm. uh, espousing value across our industry but I'd like to see the collaboration relationship <laughs> being uh, being discussed in respect to value um, and we, we've talked yeah. about return on investment earlier but somebody's very clearly uh, said in the chat it's about value. Um, and we can look yeah. at these long term relationships. And actually, we can't say you will get X percent back over a certain number of years because we're going to influence your management practices to improve operations. And actually, you know, when I, I like the way that you use the term construction ecosystem because that's going to resonate with a lot of researchers. Mm-hmm. But the mm-hmm. one thing that you didn't mention within the ecosystem, you said materials and cash. Um, and of course, mm-hmm. the managerial researchers would, of course, say, the people um, and well, the sharing of knowledge yeah. as these sort of these um, uh, also very valuable resources. Um, now we're coming very um, shortly to the close of our webinar. Do you know when we start these these events? Um, you know, th- there's so many things that we could cover. I've been delighted to see comments coming through in the chat. Lots of ideas, fantastic. Um, I've just got a couple of things that I want to share with you before we close out. And that also gives our speakers a moment to think because I'm gonna be asking them for a, for a closing word shortly. And the, the word that I would like to hear from them, and it is a one word, I will accept a hyphenated word, <laughs> but it is one word, a word that for each of you in turn represents, if you like, a desirable future in which we see you know, um, thriving ecosystem of collaborative R&D going on. What is, what, is, what is the one word that captures a desirable future for you? So I'll come to you in a moment for your closing words. But um, I just wonder if I just pop on just a couple of slides here, um, um, just, just to share with folks. Um, the Network Plus um, is coming to a close shortly. Um, we, our resources, as I've said earlier, um, will remain online. Um, we hope to convene further conversations in due course, but I'd encourage you to keep in touch with us and one another. Um, we're gonna share with you in the chat just shortly um, some, some links and some further information. And I'd like to point out now that the Transforming Construction Challenge has taken a bit of a step forward in respect of this sort of learning legacy aspect. Karen, you'll be pleased about this. The Transforming Construction Challenge within UKRI's web space, I believe, has set up something called Stronger Stories. And the idea is indeed to capture the learning from the projects and activities that the challenge has invested in. So um, we'll share some links with that with, in our follow up email, I think. Um, I just want to share with you also, um, you know, one or two things. The activity in the challenge is vast. 
the network plus is a small part of it the activities continue and i'd really encourage you if you've not explored the scope of the transforming construction challenge please do have a look get involved there's it's a massive amount of activity and i believe like our our colleagues in the panel you know there's still scope to work together um, mm -hmm. i'm going to really challenge businesses right now because i'm going to say to you please use your r d tax credits more wisely please use universities to help you with your essentially business improvements even within your firm or your project but now let's close off um uh, thanks for hannah for sharing the stronger stories link in the chat there excellent um panelists your one word for a desirable future um karen i'll come to you first please ecosystem all together ecosystem lovely thank you very much andy i'm going with flourishing i think it's important that we have a vision that is grand and flour you're flourishing for humans but flourishing for nature and the, and the planet and it it's okay to talk in those terms it doesn't all have to be techie and engineering it, that's what we want to see thank you uh, jennifer please I'm going to go for radical hyphen, so radical innovation, radical collaboration, radical mm. vision, radical whatever, but we've got to be radical. It's got to be radical. Thank you very much. Um, now, Diana, um, I suspect you might like to have a closing remark before we actually finish the session. I thought you were going to come to me and ask for my word, and actually I was going to throw a really interesting one in, which was passionate, because I think... When I talk to people who've been involved in projects, they are so proud and passionate about them and how we capture that and step change it on. I think for me, the, the challenge, and Andy talked about it, is, is how we transform the whole of our built environment. I think the exciting part is that for better or worse, the UK has a chance to do things differently. It's going on, on its own for, as I say, for better or worse. But I think there's a real opportunity here, I, I guess, and it's something I mentioned before, I really am impressed with the way the CLC has brought the industry together and uh, delivered on COVID. I think it's much harder because carbon is perhaps a less immediately burning platform, although actually it's a way, 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 way more uh, important one. But how we get that momentum going and keep it going, and I think that cannot come from just one place, the CLC, I think it comes from industry, but it absolutely comes from academia as well. And I'm really encouraged with the work of the Network Plus, truly, truly humbled by some of the projects. So I think it's really exciting. I think we're all passionate about what we need to do, but we now need to not just wipe our hands and say, well, that was a good project, and put it on the shelf and move on to something else. And my final piece, and I'm, I'm plugging Jackie's, Jackie's work, but... When I look at the stuff I'm most excited about, things like the Building a Safer Future Charter, the most important thing that will help companies deliver is leadership and cultural change. And I think that is the piece, rather than just individual fixes for projects, um, however important they are, it's about how the sector's culture changes um, that is, is going to be the, 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 the bottom line of whether we succeed or fail. Jackie, Diana, back to you. Thank you, Diana, very much indeed. Closing words. We've reached the end of our hour, folks. Thank you so much for sharing your reflections in the chat there. Um, it, keep in touch. Thank you. Um, I'm very much looking forward to participating in a flourishing, passionate ecosystem that has a radical innovation within it. My thanks uh, to our speakers today, Karen, Andy and Jennifer, and to my co-host, Diana Montgomery. Um, that's it from... Uh, the Network Plus. Thank you very much for viewing today's webinar. Keep in touch. We'll see you again soon. Bye for now.